Hey there, so today we're going to go over the thorax and thoracic spine pathologies just to give you guys kind of an idea of what some of these are. Uh, some of them are not covered in your Ryman book. Uh, they are a lot of them covered in the Prentice book and some of them are just things that I think are important for you guys to know. Um, because in sports, we actually see more of the traumatic injuries, and, and that's not always something that these books that we're reading always take into account. I do think that the Prentice book does a little bit better at that, so I would encourage you to look at the spine as well as chapter 27, which is the thorax and abdomen chapter. Uh, I think that that's really important information for you guys to know, especially on the emergency side, because a lot of this stuff is emergent type of injuries. So rib fractures, this is something that is super common in sports. Uh, often it happens at the anterior angle, but it can really kind of happen anywhere. I mean, if you get hit hard by a ball or a stick or a helmet or a knee or something, or if you fall, I've seen people go over hurdles or in the steeplechase, um, you know, uh, car accidents, there's all different kinds of ways that we can get rib fractures. But always, always, always be suspicious of internal uh, organ damage, lung, spleen, diaphragm especially. It, it can, you know, hurt other things as well. Uh, kidneys occasionally. Um, but, but these are the bigger things to really think about. The first rib is rarely ever fractured just because of its location, and, and um, which is good. But where it crosses, like it's really, it crosses right next to the brachial plexus as well as to the subclavian artery and vein. And so you have to be really careful and, and be highly suspicious of what's going on and very protective of people that potentially have a first rib fracture injury because it can cause a lot, a lot of problems for people. Um, signs and symptoms, and this is gonna be true for almost all the thorax stuff, laughing, coughing, sneezing, deep breathing, exercise, moving your upper extremity your and your torso, and to be honest, even your legs, because you're gonna have to use your core muscles to move your legs. So almost all motion is really painful uh, for people that have injuries in the thorax. Flail chest. Uh, this is something that I think is important. Again, we don't see these very commonly in sport, but they could happen. Um, they're going to be more common in assaults and, and in car accidents and stuff like that. But that doesn't mean that we're not gonna come upon those and we need to be prepared for it. So what's really happening is that you're gonna have multiple ribs that are fractured in two or more places. So you can kind of see here where, where these are broken off. So all four of these ribs are broken in two places. And so what happens is that these segments then are going to be moving in opposition to the rest of the rib cage. So as you're breathing in, that section is going to actually go in instead of out. And as you breathe out, your rib cage moves in and this section goes in the opposite direction. So that's called paradoxical motion. This is actually really painful. Um, and it can cause a lot, a lot of problems for those people. So um, the segment, again, moves in the opposite direction. Extreme pain, can cough up blood. Your O2 sats are probably gonna start tanking, um, which is called hypoxia, tachypnea, which is rapid breathing, difficulty breathing, which is respiratory distress, shock. Um, they can also experience a pneumothorax or a hemothorax. So a pneumothorax, what happens is uh, you have your pleural cavity and then the lungs, right? And you and you have those um, spaces that kind of protect because it's not just lungs up against the rib cage. I hope everybody knows that. And so what happens is the space between the lungs and that pleural cavity actually starts filling with air and then it compresses the lung on that side. Usually it doesn't carry over to the opposite side. So if it happens on the right side, you can actually collapse your entire right lung if enough air gets into that cavity. A hemothorax is the same thing except for heme, blood, right? So it's actually filling full of blood. So you can cause damage to the vessels that are in that area and actually the, the blood crushes the, the lung as well. So obviously you're gonna have respiratory problems, hypoxia, shock, all that kind of stuff kicking in. Please make sure you watch this video. It's super cool and you can see, well, I think it's cool, but you can see how it moves. Um, 
As far as care goes for it, uh, care for these are you actually need to splint it. So you need to put padding over the top of it so that way it actually starts moving. It doesn't move paradoxically with the rest of it. You can't prevent it from moving in when the rib cage is moving out and up, but you can prevent it from moving out when the rib cage is moving down and in. And so those are the things to really think about when, when we're trying to treat people. So for this, we're definitely trying to pad it. So you would be like wrapping, um, uh, well, there's a lot of things you can wrap, but putting some kind of towel, blanket, padding over the top of it, and then either taping it down, which is something that's done really commonly, and or um, wrapping like an ace wrap or something around them to hold it in place. Even if they just put their hand over it or you put their hand over it, it will help significantly in, in those kinds of situations. Fractured sternum, direct force. Typically we see these, you know, people are in car accidents and they come forward and they hit their, their chest right on, um, right on the steering wheel. And uh, assaults, these things can happen, but you really need to be looking for heart and lung injuries because those are really what's life-threatening. A fractured sternum doesn't kill you, but crushing your heart is, uh, it's a big deal. And so the thing that you need to know is the fractured sternum doesn't have a high mortality rate. It's all the things that can come along with it are what kill you. Notice that's 45%, like half of the people almost can die from this stuff. So myocardial contusions, cardiac ruptures, cardiac tamponade, um, and then commotio cordius. This is something that we actually see in sports probably the most commonly. It usually happens in youth and adolescents, and um, particularly in football who aren't well padded in ice hockey, and then in baseball, especially baseball. Sometimes softball, but mostly baseball. What happens is the kids turn into it, and then the baseball actually hits them in the sternum. And really what it is, it's, it's an unfortunate grouping of events, but the general gist of it is you get hit at a bad point in your PQRST, like the, the pumping kind of mechanism, and it stuns your heart and it actually disrupts your heart rhythm. And it can put people into tachycardia, it can put people into crazy arrhythmias, and or it can actually put you into an asystole, which means like the flat line, no heart beating at all. Um, and people die from that. And it's actually not that crazy uncommon in youth. Um, the older we get, the more solid our sternum is, so the less likely that ta to happen just from a baseball. But certainly contact injuries and that kind of thing can, can really do that. Um, so we need to be careful and, and really monitor people. Um, shocking with our AEDs won't bring them back because it won't shock an, asyst an asystole. So calling 911 is gonna be crazy important. Um, for fractured sternums, displacement of a sternal fracture is not very common. So we have the manubrium, the body, and the xiphoid process. It is possible to break the xiphoid process off, and again, we have to be really careful because that can puncture lungs and, and you know all that kind of stuff, which is never any good. And so like we talk about that with CPR. And so knowing that that is a possibility is something we need to think about. But all the things that we talked about before about moving, breathing, that kind of stuff is going to hurt. Uh, sometimes people have to go to surgery to have them sewn um, or to staple slash wired back together. Um, but a lot of times, uh, sometimes they just people put people in a figure of eight brace. Uh, sometimes they just kind of let them be. But a figure of eight brace is pretty good because it kind of holds everything in place, although it can make things pretty uncomfortable for people. So um, time is basically the best cure for that. Dislocated ribs. Um, actually, this is not uncommon in, in contact sports, so you will probably see these happen. And you can get them in the sternocostal, so up front, and then the interchondral uh, joints as well. Um, it, so it can happen um, right off the sternum. It can happen, and we'll talk a little bit about this is uh, sometimes being named another thing, but it can happen like right between the, the cartilage and, and the ribs, and then we can also have it happen in the back. So actually, first rib dislocations and subluxations are not uncommon coming off the spine, and um, hopefully you guys learn how to treat those in your rehab class. Uh, otherwise, we can talk about it if you guys want to. But um, 
The concern is that it can lead to secondary injury of the vessels, nerves, and muscles, especially when we're talking about the posterior coming off the thoracic spine. Usually we're gonna see it happen unilaterally, so, and it, it often happens in ribs eight through 10, which is good and also kind of bad. Um, you always need to look at the lower or the deeper organs. So again, kidneys, if you got hit hard enough to dislocate a rib, especially like on the backside, really, really assess your kidneys. You need to be looking for blood in their urine and all that kind of stuff. Liver, uh, diaphragm, make sure that you're really doing a thorough evaluation of their internal organs because stuff can get messed up. So look, listen, feel with the heart, right? So we're putting our stethoscope on and we're listening to breath sounds three on one side, two on the other, uh, heart has the two, the non-heart has, or sorry, heart, we have the liver on the other side, that takes up a lot of space too, guys, so hopefully we remember that as well, so, um, separation is, again, the costochondral, so remember I said that we can do that, again, these are usually at the cartilage between ribs three and ten, up front, the rest of them, though, we can get it off the front or in the back, like I said, um, all the same signs and symptoms. Like I said, all this torso stuff is going to be the same. The one thing that you might maybe see is a displacement. So you can really feel it with the first rib up top when that happens. Usually they're superiorly uh, displaced when they dislocate. Um, we can see them uh, sometimes in, in the back where like if they go into flexion, you'll see the rib if it's a uh, posterior or superior. I, I don't often see them go inferiorly. Usually they're superior or posterior. It depends on how they got hit and the muscles. And they can't really go anterior, right? Cause you know, the vertebrae are right there. So they don't, they're up against the vertebrae as it is. So, um, but occasionally I'm sure it's possible to go inferior. I just don't see that. I, ha I personally haven't seen that happen. Um, thoracic compression fractures. So these are from trauma. So falls, lifting heavy stuff, previous history, and car accidents. This is actually my mom's spine. She was in a major car accident and had a compression fracture of her thoracic vertebral spine. Notice also she has some kyphosis in there and she has osteoporosis. But notice these really nice bodies. And then this one's just crushed to shit and she actually had some narrowing of her spinal canal. So she had a little bit of impingement on her spinal cord as well as her nerve root. So I ended up actually going home in the middle of the semester uh, to help take care of her because she couldn't do a whole lot of stuff. Um, but decreased bone density, so this osteoporosis, she had osteoporosis, so that kind of came into it. But we can see things happening in our athletes and, and active people from running and jumping and, and getting these compression fractures. Um, men and women have different risk factors, so I think it's a good idea to understand those, but history of fracture, osteoporosis, decreased height, so if they've been getting shorter, we might be seeing some of these things happening in, and it might be in the vertebral bodies or it could be intervertebral disc problems and then physical activity. Uh, but what you'll see is a wedge shaped fracture. So notice kind of thick and then it usually gets pinched. So the anterior portion is usually what gets crushed. Um, sudden intense pain, it hurts a lot. Uh, it continues in the night, worse was flexion because again, you're crushing the, the part that already got smushed decreased range of motion from pain. And by range of motion, it's not just thoracic, it's arms. You really can barely do hardly anything. Um, and then this is the brace that you get put in. This is my mama. These are like the only pictures that she let me took and she might maybe kill me. <laughs> she might maybe kill, she might maybe kill me for putting these in here, but uh, it was a full C-spine immobilizer that ran all the way down her torso and then she covered it up, sorry, but she this brace wrapped all the way around her and went um, over and around her hips. So she wasn't able to pick up anything greater than like a cup of coffee. Uh, she couldn't cut things. She, could, um, she couldn't take showers, wash her hair because she couldn't bend forward. Um, she couldn't get dressed, like we had to help her basically do everything, um, hence me going home. So uh, it's, it's a big deal when these happen, especially when they start impinging on nerves and everything. So make sure that you're taking into account what's happening. I uh, had an athlete once have this happen in his lumbar vertebrae where he redirected a cow. 
that was charging him full on. Didn't want to go in a gate. So it's possible to do it in other vertebral areas. The thoracic vertebrae seem to be maybe a little bit more common, but if, if there's a body, fra a body fracture, like a compression fracture of a vertebrae, um, it's usually going to be a compression fracture and it'll go into the wedge and, and they can affect a lot of things and they can be very, very painful for people. Okay. Uh, costochondritis. This is super common in sports. Uh, I've seen it actually a lot in rowers. You can also see it in tennis athletes and swimmers. Sometimes, you know, some of our upper body athletes, so throwers like the, the baseball, softball kind of thing. Um, occasionally in in football quarterbacks but i would argue maybe not quite as commonly i've actually seen it in ice hockey goalies occasionally as well um, but what happens is your costal cartilage starts to get inflamed and it starts hurting and it's gonna present itself a lot like a subluxed or dislocated rib but without actual movement of it it's just inflammation and so you're gonna have chest pain and all the same kinds of things. Coughing can cause it or coughing illness like bronchitis or pneumonia because you're always aggravating those um, junctions. Um, but again, repetitive upper head activities or direct blows. It typically happens more in females than in males um, across like the spectrum of all human beings. Um, I would say, you know, if we're going to talk about from direct blow, potentially more in males and females because uh, they tend to be in more contact sports. But in general, um, this is something really to kind of think about. They're going to have pain usually only on one side. It's not nearly, I, I would say when I've seen this happen, it usually happens at one or a couple ribs and it's only on one side. Is it possible to have it on both? Sure. Um, and in that case, it would probably be a lot more related to some kind of coughing illness that was very ongoing. Uh, especially if they had a lot of bouts of coughing episodes that were really just like big kinds of things. Um, but it's gonna hurt with all the same breathing stuff that we talked about, the sneezing, the everything else, moving their upper extremity, uh, deep breathing and, and trunk and upper extremity problems are gonna be presenting themselves anytime they're like stretching so coming back so if I'm a backstroker if I'm doing fly if I'm freestyle or if I'm trying to serve or really reach for something or throw or really reach out like basically opening up the rowers get it from coming and like really extending their chest and coming back again so going around and around and again I would say that probably I've seen this most in rowers but that doesn't mean that that's the only place that you're gonna see it um, also, the pain can come and go, and a lot of times it's going to be worse when they're actually playing their sports and doing their activities. So certainly, you need to ask a really good history. Uh, thoracic outlet syndrome. Thankfully, this does not happen commonly in sports, but you do see it in, in, in patients, and, and occasionally it will happen. Um, so here, let me move my dude over so you can see the whole entire picture. But Basically, it's a problem either with your brachial plexus or with your subclavian vessels, meaning the artery or the vein. And there's neurogenic, arterial, and venous. You need to know that all three of these happen, but that the neurogenic is really the most common. Like the, the brachial plexus is really what we see being messed up the most, which is a good thing and a bad thing. It's good because we're still getting blood supply to and from the arm, but it's a bad thing because you know, arteries and veins have a tendency to fix a little bit better than nerves do. So um, females happens way more commonly in females and usually in people between 20 and 50. So we're not gonna see it very commonly in like our kids in middle schools and high schools. It can happen, but not very common. Um, but we will potentially see it in our collegiate and pro athletes. Uh, trauma, certainly. So like first rib getting um, pushed down um or sorry pushed up on it and then also the the clavicle if we get clavicular fractures that can be a problem in coming in and impinging upon that kind of stuff repetitive stress overhead sport so we're pinching it over and over and over between that first rib and and the clavicle um sitting at keyboards and getting that terrible posture so having the the upper cross syndrome scaling hypertrophy 
So if these guys aren't very strong anymore, we're not going to have very good uh, uh, protection for what's going on with our ribs and stuff. Weak traps, levator, or rhomboids. But then also tight traps, levator, or pecs. And this is coming from that cross syndrome, right? So it depends on what we're doing. Do we have upper crossed or not? What are the muscles doing in here that are pulling on everything? Because this stuff can cause problems with what's going on and pinching. So the problem is they're gonna have kind of random complaints that can be kind of vague. They're gonna be like, oh, it hurts when I do this, but not all the time. Or like it hurts when I do this and not this, but then it really hurts when I do this. And, and, and you're gonna be like, what the heck is going on with you? Um, and, and it might ebb and flow. Like some days it might hurt them when they throw and other days it might not. Um, there can be lots of problems with their ability to move their arms, to feel things, to, to be strong, to have normal range of motion. Arm heaviness and fatigue is actually not very uncommon. Um, the intolerance to cold, I haven't had people have that, but uh, it's a thing. Uh, if you're gonna mess with vessels and nerves, it's not weird to have changes like in temperature and sensation and stuff like that. Um, forward head with rounded shoulders. So again, we're looking more at that upper cross syndrome kind of thing. Restric restricted C-spine or rib mobility. So again, we need to make sure that we're assessing the ribs to see if they're moving similar right to left and if they have that little bit of give. And then decreased pec major, minor, scaling, and trapezius flexibility. So again, going back to that upper cross syndrome stuff. Vascular TOS, thoracic outlet syndrome, upper extremity pallor, meaning that it doesn't carry the same color. And again, this is almost always unilateral, guys. It's not usually bilateral. Um, weakness and fatigue. It is really, really uncommon for it to be bilateral. Really uncommon for it to be bilateral, okay? Um, Yep. Uh, and then there's lots of tests that we'll talk about how to assess for this kind of stuff. And then uh, diaphragmatic paralysis. So have you guys heard, I'm assuming, of people getting hit in the solar plexus? So this is that transient paralysis. Super common in contact sports. You get hit kind of right at that, um, at the uh, angle or the notch right below where your um, xiphoid is and it just stuns it in your solar plexus so people basically can't breathe because their diaphragm kind of got stunned. Um, but you can also have damage to your phrenic nerve. Interestingly, but also importantly, and a good thing is it only affects half the diaphragm because right, your phrenic nerve splits into right and left, so it's only going to affect the right side or the left side of your diaphragm instead of the entire diaphragm, um, which is great. But it can also, you know, mess things up big time. It still allows you to breathe though, but unilateral phrenic nerve damage um, results in paradoxical motion of the diaphragm actually. So it's not moving the way it should and it changes based upon the pressure that's being pulled in and out um, by the opposite side. So the parallel muscle will remove, oh, moves in response to the air pressure, the positive negative air pressure and, and not other stuff. Um, one quick thing that I wanted to go back to that I think I forgot to say with rib fractures. Um, with rib fractures, one of the things that we see, uh, and these are more stress fractures that we see, um, are in baseball pitchers, but it's not in their throwing side, it's usually in their opposite side. So if I'm right-handed and I'm gonna pitch a ball, what's happening is on my left side then, I'm really using my other arm to bring me around, right? And so this, what that what that does is all the muscles in start pulling, pulling, pulling on on that first rib. And so what we'll see is unilateral stress fractures in their non-dominant arm. So if pitchers or some people, maybe your infielders are throwing crazy hard or, or some of your people are rotating across a lot of different positions, and they're complaining of this weird kind of achy pain that's that's on their non-dominant side, typically near their neck. It, it can really be anywhere throughout it, but usually we see it on the posterior side where all the big muscles are. Um, it could be a stress fracture of the first rib. It could also be um, a subluxation or a dislocation of the first rib on that side. Um, so always be suspicious in your overhead people who really use their, their opposite arm to help with the momentum of bringing them around that 
their injury may or may not be in their dominant side. It, it can very well be in their non-dominant side and it's because of the motions that they're going through. Um, and again, uh, as far as resetting these, it is possible for us to reset them. You need to be taught how to do it correctly and there's some breathing uh, that goes into it on the part of the patient and positioning and, and usually a little thrust action. Um, but uh, just know that they cannot go back to participation right away if you reset a rib, if it's been dislocated or subluxated, because as soon as they start contracting those muscles again, it's going to come right back out. So just keep that in mind. And if you guys have questions, let me know.